I'm Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network. If you're not familiar with us, we're a group of people that um, are unaffiliated, spiritually oriented people that want to change the world in a positive way. And to find out more about us, please visit our website, sacredinclusion.com. Today, I'm honored to be talking with Reverend Dr. Terry Trueblood, who has a very, very interesting background, as we'll explore a little bit in our little uh, video interview. And Terry is um, doing um, an exploration for our network on the 16th of July at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I'll post the link um, in the show notes so you can see it and find out information about it. But um, as you're about to discover, Terry has a very interesting background, and I'm going to just give you, him a somewhat formal um, introduction, and uh, we'll talk about that as we get into the podcast. Um, Terry, prior to becoming what I'm calling a metaphysical practitioner, spent 30 years as an Illinois state law enforcement investigator and emergency medical technician instructor. He's the leading authority in something called, he is a leading authority, I should say, on something called dive rescue profession. And in fact, earned the 2010 Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Association of Life Association of Dive Rescue Specialists. After redirecting his investigation skills towards the study of mystical fields, he obtained a doctorate in mystical research, became a master hypnotherapist and regressionist, EFT practitioner, meditation instructor, and metaphysical minister. He's also a tuning fork practitioner, which I don't really know what that is, but um, it sounds very interesting, as is Terry. Um, <laughs> Terry, welcome to this uh, video podcast, and um, yeah, happy to have you. Thanks, Angelo. Appreciate it. It's going to be fun. <laughs> now, you know my first question because you've seen my script, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, you know, it's not often that one puts the words cop and metaphysics in the same paragraph, but you can do it very, very, um, you know, very easily because that's kind of who you are, at least your background. So the simple question is, how did you evolve to becoming a law enforcement professional to a meta metaphysical practitioner? Well, you know, towards the end of my career, um, I started getting asked to do things that were metaphysical in nature. Um, people were believing their house had ghosts in there. And so, you know, I'm a crime scene technician and other things, uh, many, many different kinds of things in law enforcement because they're constantly in training. Anyway, long story short, uh, I have called and I'd say, well, what are you calling me for, for something like that? And I said, well, you're the only only person we know who could come and check this out and see if it's legit or whatever. So I started getting into that and, you know, some businesses were having problems, things were happening inside their um, places when certain people or employees were, were there. And uh, so I was able to go in and actually clear, um, it was kind of all natural, so to speak at that point. Uh, and I did have a person that kind of rode right chair with me on a couple of those things. And so after I got a few of those things going, word, one thing leads to another, you know, and next thing you know, you're, you're, you're doing ghost busting, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, which I decided right then and there, I said, you know, if I'm going to be getting into this, I, I really get to go back to school and get myself fully up to speed on all this. So, you know, and, and in law enforcement, you know, the, the crossover is pretty easy because uh, especially, you know, we did a lot of white collar type crime i've done others of course but uh but the point was a lot of times i didn't see my suspect and for people who don't see in the spirit uh you don't see your suspect either and so you apply the same rules of investigation the same rules of evidence collection and the same interview and interrogation skills and those things i've been doing for so long it's very very quick for me to get right to the nub of the issue uh, with a homeowner or business owner or, or whatever. And so, yeah, the transfer was uh, relatively painless. It was the same thing I've been doing all along, just different kind of target suspect. Yeah, I mean, you explained to me earlier when we talked um, that basically you're doing the same thing. You're going from the unknown to the known. Right, exactly right. Yep. And, you know, um, as people ask, oh, you get scared doing that? No, not really. You get a 45 stuck to your head, 
where they're going to blow your skull off. <laughs> you might get a little scared there, but this other stuff, not so much. But a lot of people put a lot of emotion into it, which, uh, you know, as a law enforcement officer, you're trained to de-emotionalize yourself so that you can function squarely and, and make good quality decisions. And that's that's how we apply it. So um, we're going to get into some a little bit esoteric um, kind of um, terminology and discourse here. And But I wanted to start kind of like from a level playing field so people can understand kind of where you're coming from. And um, the title of our exploration is Spiritual Discernment, and I probably should read a little bit of it. Um, Everybody knows what discernment, we have to we have to discern, we have to make decisions in our daily lives as to what to do, basically. That's discernment. Um, but we're talking about another kind of spiritual discernment, which we're calling spiritual discernment. And these include the non-physical aspects of life, such as intuition and dreams, and also includes such things as, you, you, you mentioned ghosts, psychic phenomena, paranormal activity. And um, so that's what we're going to be doing. So um, I want to start with a simple place, which is dream interpretation. All of us dream. Many of us, as, as I've discovered, don't remember our dreams, but all of us dream. Um, it's, it, but it's a, somewhat of an art to be able to discern uh, what's useful in the dream, the dreams that we have. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could give us a quick um, kind of overview as to um, how to discern reality um, from dreams. Sure, absolutely. Well, discernment, I, I kind of break into two things here. I'll say discernment in trying to determine what's affecting you. What are you seeing, hearing, feeling, that kind of discernment, which is related to the dreams. And then the other discernment is when you go out to deal with practitioners that are supposed to assist you. So I want to be able to discern, is this a good practitioner or somebody I should stay away from? And right. then the other discernment is what's actually physically happening to you. Um, and so as it relates to the dreams, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm an Edgar Casey fan and Edgar Casey, of course, the famous sleeping prophet of the 20th century give over 14,000 readings in his sleep, so to speak, um, or in trance, basically out. Uh, and he often said that, you know, and he did say, there was nothing that happened to you that didn't happen in your dreams first. And so, but dreams utilize um, what I call your clip art. So people that are familiar with computers, there's clip art programs, and we each develop our own clip art based on our education, experience, uh, life, issues and so forth and so your clip art might be 1.1 might be 1.2 the next guy's 1.3 that's how i kind of make an analogy to it and so the uh, other side is going to take those experiences and help plop them in your dream so to speak and so the people that are in your dreams are characterizations of issues that are ongoing, you know, people, uh, vehicles, jewels, money, you name it, any kind of topic. And it's trying to teach you something. It's trying to make you aware of something that's going on in your life or a focus that you need to either resolve or work further towards. And so you have lots of different kinds of dreams that are available as well. So there's, so that's, um, you know, that's, um, kind of garden variety dreaming. Everybody does that. Um, but as you know, there's other kinds of dreaming also, such, such as lucid dreaming. Maybe talk briefly about those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I always talk about, you know, during the day, we 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 go through lots of different kinds of, you know, issues. And, and it's just like working in an office and your files get all over your desk and stuff. And so you have those sorting dreams kind of puts everything back in place for you. So the next day you're kind of reset and ready to go. And those are pretty routine. That's what I call them anyway. And everybody has their own nomenclature on what they want to call these dreams but uh the second uh, th portion of the dream is is where you are starting to get a message and when you talk about lucid dreaming what you're really talking about is your awareness during the dream that you're in a dream and if you're in a dream do you have the ability to change it? Well, the answer is yes. You can interact at the dream level, uh, depending on how advanced you are and stuff. I mean, I've been doing lucid dreaming since I was a little kid, so I can remember dreams from when I was in first grade. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to, and Bill, you go back and redream. And a lot of people, when I have the opportunity to interact with them on discerning their dreams and, and breaking that down, it, it's a dream they've redreamed multiple times. And uh, because there's an issue there that keeps coming up in their life and they just need to figure out what it is. I mean, an example would be uh, you're in a racing car and it's going around Kirby mountain road, something like that. And so, you know, it's really dangerous, this, that, and the other. 
and you feel some fear in that process. So the first question I'm asking to that person, are you driving or are you riding, you passenger? If you're driving, that means you're in control. You're doing it. If you're riding, you're letting other people drive your ship uh, in your life. You need to take a look at those folks. Who are they and what are they doing and how do I get control back? Where well, I'm the guy driving the car and I don't have to go about the round, mountain road. I can take my country street road out here in prairie land where I'm at. <laughs> so uh, so that, that's part of lucid dreaming. So um, again, I want to um, sort of establish a sort of a practical baseline. And, um, and, and from talking to you, I know that, that you can help me with this. So basically, whenever you go to, like, let's say, um, I don't know, a ghost investigation or a crime scene, um, you have to use different senses, right? You have to use your kind of your, your mental knowledge, maybe your knowledge of criminal behavior or something like that, or maybe even the suspect or something like that. You also have to use your gut. And if you're advanced or you have some awareness, maybe your spiritual senses. Can you talk about a little bit about the integration of these things for what we're calling um, spiritual discernment? You know, interesting, you said crime scene or ghost thing. Those things have overlapped for me before. I know, that's why um, I use it. <laughs> and, and so uh, when you're out there at a death scene uh, and you're trying to take photos or whatever, especially if you're taking them electronically like today, um, it, you, you can have interference on your camera. And it's happened to me many times. And, and it's spirit interference. I mean, you're getting perfectly good pictures for years on end with the same camera you go to a crime scene or a death scene or whatever the case may be and um all of a sudden you get all kinds of flaws in your in your pictures and uh if you know how to deal with that you can you can actually talk to somebody they, they can they'll adjust your electrical issues uh pretty quickly if there is an actual spirit present that and usually if the spirit's present um, and oftentimes after a death, they are present for, a, for some time. They actually want to kind of check on things with their family and friends or whatever. And if they have an undone communication of some sort, uh, that's when they're trying to get your attention and they want to communicate in some way. I mean, listen to us. I mean, we, we talk on this side of the veil all the time. We're on TV, we're on radio, we're on podcasts, and we're talking all the time. But when you go to the other side, nothing changes. You still want to communicate with your loved ones and, and tell people's cool stuff that you're doing. And that's where a lot of ghosts come from. And they're not necessarily bad. Uh, it's just that they need communication. So they'll cause issues, you know, like uh, what we would call poltergeist type issues, start moving things around and making noise and doing things like that. Uh, and, you know, people do get, or spirit does get attached to uh, mostly buildings and sites um, that, that, that they're familiar with and they think is theirs and they don't want anything else happening there. And then a few, a much, much smaller percentage get attached to people. So no matter where you move to, the thing's coming with. And there you go. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, you said that there's you, you've you've seen overlap from your sort of your your, your crime experience and your metaphysical experience. I wonder if you give give me an example of that. Uh, well, you know, I, I'm a uh, underwater crime scene investigator and uh, commander of a dive rescue teams and and, and was for the state um, for the for many many years and I've uh, been doing it for 40 years uh, straight. So, uh, I, fortunately, I have some abilities, as you know, uh, in a, what people might call the psychic realm or whatever. So a lot of times I can listen, feel, see, whatever, get input as to where somebody may or may not be, especially like in an underwater drowning situation where you don't know where they're at. You know, most crime scenes, it's right there. But when you're doing underwater stuff, you got to go find your crime scene first. And so many times I've had that thing and I would tell people you know see this point this buoy or something you come forward about 20 feet just slightly off to the left there's where you're gonna find them. how do you know that well just trust me I, I know what I'm doing and uh, but a lot of that comes from training and experience as well but there's there's a bit of an overlap there uh, where you know I'm getting information they're not of course I'm not going to necessarily say that out at the scene because you know you don't want to be uh, labeled as a nut job I just let uh, the fruits of the victory in other words, the recovery, uh, prove out what I was saying is, is accurate. So yeah, it's it's pretty interesting that way. So Terry, I know you've been involved with a number of sort of investigations involving haunted, haunted houses. Um, yeah. Can you describe what's involved and how you go about determining what's going on in a situation like that? Sure, I mean, it's it runs down just a regular assessment first 
talk to the people that are calling you. What are they seeing, feeling, hearing, saying, seeing, all that kind of stuff. Some of their history also. Because keep in mind, like attracts like. If, if people have had abusive you know, issues in the past, you know, they can, uh, they can uh, attract an abusive type spirit, similar. Uh, if they've been an alcoholic or a drug addict and that sort of thing, you can also attract those spirits that have yet to cross over. Um, because when you do pass, uh, I, I consider it a kind of an 80-20 rule, maybe 85-15 rule, about 85% crossed into the light like what you hear about on TV shows and whatnot. But there is a percentage, maybe 15%, that go into what I would call the gray. And uh, they are here earthbound uh, for a while, and as long as they want to be, in, in fact. And the longer they are, the, the worse it is for them, in my opinion, because they, they kind of lose track on where they need to go. And sometimes you need to assist them and open up a, a vortex, so to speak, for them and tell them how to get moved across where they really need to be. And so those are the things that go bump in the night. Those are the, the ghosts, if you will. Sir, you, Terry, you've heard, you told me the story before, but I want to hear the, 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 the ceramic, um, the ceramic story again. Oh, the ceramic wiener dog story? Yeah, tell me people about that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I got a call uh, from an individual uh, female. She was an untrained psychic and she had been uh, for many, many years. And long story short, she was <laughs> like at two in the morning, she got woke up from a, a dream, you know, and it said, hey, you're gonna get this ceramic wiener dog in the mail in a day or two and uh, it's evil, you don't want it, you gotta keep it. So she actually bumps her elbow, elbows her husband, says, hey, write this down and he's like, what evil wiener dog what are you talking about <laughs> and so he he wrote it all down you know so he could go back to sleep i think more than anything but a couple of days later sure enough uh, the husband's everybody's gone the husband's there a ups guy shows up and and uh he opens up this box unknown box uh and they weren't expecting i mean they didn't order anything and i don't know how it even got there it's a long story but um he opens up and looks in there and in bubble wrap as a ceramic wiener dog he goes <laughs> evil wiener dog no you can't stay here so following his wife's instructions he took it out of the trash and threw the whole thing in and uh so that later that night he, he came home and they're prepping supper and all that stuff and so he's telling his wife hey the evil wiener dog showed up and i threw it in the trash well his, his daughter who was uh, early teens like maybe 13 or something like that uh she was oh, no dad he wasn't he wasn't in the trash he goes oh yeah i put him in the trash you know still wrapped up and all that she goes, no, he was out of the wrapping. He was on the grass when I got home off school bus. He was really, well, what'd you do with it? Well, I grabbed it and I put it in my room. Oh my God, evil wiener dogs in the house. So she, he goes, go get that dog. It's, it's out of here. You know, that kind of thing is the story. And uh, so she goes up to her room upstairs and dad, you better get up here. So mom and dad run upstairs. And she goes, I put this wiener dog on right here by my TV because I thought he was cute. He's now sitting in my bed. And they're like, oh, evil wiener dog. So he grabs it, puts it in the box. They go downstairs to, to do supper. And um, uh, things started moving around. You know, spoons moving around and different things, drawers opening. This kind of stuff was happening over the course of some time there. And then the box actually starts walking down the hallway. <laughs> and, and so he's like, like evil wiener dog's got to be locked up. So they grab, he grabs it, takes it out to a shed, throws it in there, locks it up. There's no windows in the shed, just the just the door he's got the key uh and he goes yeah, we're gonna get rid of this tomorrow and uh so the next day uh we went out there or he went out there and uh opened it up and uh when the dog's gone they searched to find it back in the house uh so grabs the evil wiener dog up back out puts it in a cooler pours salt <laughs> on it puts heavy weights on it and says you need to call somebody I, this is not good this is uh as a bad thing so i get the call get brought up to speed like I've just done for you all. And then uh, I was got on the phone and he went out to get the wiener dog and it's gone again. It's gone out of the, out of the, nobody's been in it. So he went back, eventually they found it on the property again and he went out and he made a bolt and everything like this, opened it up in the cooler, still had the salt and everything on it. And uh, came back the next day and uh, to, to actually go through the process of getting rid of it properly. And it was gone again and has not been seen since. And really what this was, in my opinion, as I assessed the whole thing, it was a, a sexually oriented uh, attachment to an object, which does happen, of course. 
And so the reason it wasn't because it went to a, a pubescent female and went from TV to bed and it was an attractant to her. So really this would have been what, I guess from a churchy church point of view, a, a demon demonic attachment to an item which would have had eventually she'd had emotional response to and it went into her bed. So that in and of itself tells you where it's headed uh, in, in this re, in this situation. And since she's right at that starting at puberty time, it was easy for me to see what it was. But fortunately, to my knowledge, um, I lost contact with those those folks and because it, it disappeared. And uh, one thing that uh, the father asked, he said, could this thing have disappeared because it knew we called you? And I said, well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you do get a bit of a reputation if you do this enough on the other side. I mean, they hear and see all that stuff. So uh, they didn't, whatever this thing was, did not want to be banished to wherever I was going to banish it to. Uh, <laughs> and so the, the, so the evil, evil D wiener dog is still out there somewhere. If you get one on your doorstep, I guess don't accept it. I don't know. Or give me a buzz. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is a, a good segue. You know, as you know, uh, you, you have a Christian background. And um, as you know, the Christian literature is filled with um, anecdotes about um, non-physical creatures such as um, wiener dogs, not necessarily wiener dogs, but angels and demons. Uh, what's your view of the reality of such creatures? And what's your experience dealing with them? Well, um, is there a reality out there? You know, I would I'd kind of go with the science of this. I don't get too wrapped up in, in the religion. But of course, in the ancient days, all they had was religion. So when they didn't have science, it was always religion, religion, religion. And, you know, the, the priests of old were the doctors. They were also the lawyers and they were judges and as well as the leadership and uh, clergy. So um, when you don't know, kind of refer to it as faith issues and stuff. But we kind of know this is these are these are energies because um, energies you can't destroy. They just can morph, change position, so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, can there be what we would consider, you know, nasty, evil energies? Yeah, it's, it's lower vibrational energies. Um, we have a technology now that you can actually, for the most part, see at least structurally that there is something present. And then obviously you can see the signs of, of something happening. So, you know, we, we, we try to address those things from a logical point of view. But anytime you get a higher vibration, coming into a lower vibration, the higher vibration is going to over, overwhelm the lower vibration. That's what an exorcist and so forth, they call in angels and so forth. Uh, people's belief in angels, each person has their own belief system based on how they've been socially conditioned since they were a child. And I'm not, I don't, I don't care how you were socially conditioned, you, you're going to have uh, some kind of system in your mind that that's the way it is. Well, I, you know, had that as well. But I also said, I, the, give me more data, give me more data, give me more data and I'll figure it out. Uh, but yes, there are vibrational entities, higher vibrational entities that um, are constantly around you to assist you. But you got to ask, that's kind of one of the rules of the universe. You got to ask, you can't just sit there and expect an angel type energy to assist you without you asking. And so what a, an exorcist does is they ask. Um, and they'll use uh, Jesus the Christ uh, or, you know, some archetypal um, type power that is considered good to displace. In other words, high vibration displacing low vibration and pushing that uh, bad or lower vibrational entity away or out or so forth. Now, Terry, a number of our listeners have probably been in contact with uh, various people that consider themselves spiritual teachers. And we talked about this in the beginning of our, our session today. Um, and, and also they hear, they hear lots of, um, information that may be true. It may sound very, very, you know, flowery and, and wonderful. Um, and I know this is a long conversation that we could have about this, but, uh, in general, um, what can a sincere seeker do to ascertain what is truth and what is not? Well, I would say research, but the challenge is usually you get some reference and they say, oh, this guy's really good or this girl's really good and you should you know, spend 200 bucks and get a reading from them and so forth. But fine. I mean, you're welcome to do that. Uh, I will say this, that if they're legitimate, ethical uh, readers, if you do get a reading, they'll generally tell you, uh, I, I'm not going to read you every week. Um, I'm going to once every maybe six months, 
uh, at, the, at the quickest. And some people just get a reading once a year, just to kind of see if they're on track and so forth. So there are a lot of, um, you know, snake oil salesmen out there, so to speak. And if you have the right skill set, you can make up quite a bit of stuff. And if you have three readers, let's say sitting in a room and they have one person they're reading, they're all going to read the person slightly differently because it's a distortion. Each one of us has our own distortion based on our training and experience, social conditioning. So what I might see as a, a positive energy, the next guy next to me might see as an angel. You see what I'm saying? So, and they're all saying the same thing. Uh, I've always said, if you get a reader that's above 70%, in other words, you know, they can get that high in accuracy. You, you've done really well. And I've seen some people I would put in the, in the upper 90 percentile that have done really, really well. However, um, it, it, you should assess this kind of like you would a used car salesman too, um, because there are not a lot of ethical boundaries for a lot of people and they will do whatever. And as a guy who did a lot of consumer fraud type stuff for, for citizens, uh, you can get really wrapped up in it, especially if your own emotional issues going on. Uh, you may want to seek more professional help before you, you know, go to the, to the psychic. It's okay to go, but just keep in mind, you can become addicted to one after another, after another. And it is exciting to hear about yourself. Uh, and so people want to hear about me, me, me. And so they're willing to pay that. And, but what happens is you don't want to lose your inner guidance mm -hmm. because the inner guidance is everything you want to just, if you want to talk to somebody about it and it kind of matches your inner guidance, great uh but that's where you're going to get your best stuff uh, honestly and once you get to that point where you can meditate or or get to that through yoga or whatever union with god you want to do that's probably your best bet yeah that's 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 good general advice and i, I think it's a little bit more pernicious actually for people to get involved in um, what i'm going to call cults i don't like the word um but you know i, I have known personally people that have gotten really really you know just totally entranced with the char charismatic individual, and perhaps they have psychological issues. I don't know, but um, you know, it's um, it's just yeah, interesting. Some people are more are more susceptible to that, you know. As B.T. Barnum said, "There's one born every day." He's talking about a you know sucker, and and they draw those folks to them like flies, and that's they play on that. And so we really have to be cautious when we decide if they're trying to control you, extract money or property from yeah. you. Those are telltale signs that, you know, you don't need to be anywhere around that because you need to be self-sufficient, in control, keep your money, spend it wisely. I always say, you know, getting a psychic things like going to Vegas. Um, you know, if you go to Vegas, set a budget, you know, I'm going to spend a hundred bucks on <laughs> slots for entertainment purposes only. And I can afford that, so to speak. Uh, but I'm not going to go out there with wide open. And next thing you know, they've extracted a hundred thousand dollars from me. So uh, same kind of thing with this and references from people you trust that they've got a really excellent reading from somebody is really, really helpful. Uh, but, it, but honestly, I've had people that are high end been on TV and uh, maybe they gave me a great reading. But I've had a friend who went to him and got a horrible reading. And so there's biorhythms that you're sometimes as a reader, you're on or you're off. And ethically, they should really be saying, look, I don't think we're just we're not jiving today because not all readers are for all people. And so, uh, you know, here's your money back or let's reschedule, see if we can try it again. And that's perfectly acceptable, very ethical if, if people will do that. But a lot of times that's just not what what happens and in some states i know nevada for an example i mean it's it's pretty regulated with that kind of thing you got to be very very uh cautious if you're going to be the reader it's got to be licensed and all kinds of stuff so yeah yeah that's probably about a bad idea that yeah. uh, such, such sort of rules and regulations be put in place to protect people because yeah. people are very susceptible that's just yeah, the nature really of being, being a like, human like the pied piper you know play the flute and they're all following you yeah yeah <laughs> All right, let me read a little bit about our description, um, that, the thing that we're going to do on, on Saturday the 16th at 11 a.m., and, um, and then I'm going to ask you what people should expect if they choose to attend. Sure. And I'll, I'll just sort of cut to the chase here. So the aim of our experiential exploration is to advance our skills in a special kind of discernment, spiritual discernment, an area that's cut in, far from cut and dry. As I said before, these include non-physical aspects of life, such as intuition and dreams, We'll also explore such phenomena as ghost, psychic phenomena, and paranormal activity. We may use some simple exercises to practice how to integrate what our mind, heart, and spiritual senses are telling us before we do anything, before we go further. 
<clears throat> so <clears throat> if people choose to spend an hour and a half with us on Saturday the 16th, Terry, what might they expect? Well, of course, you know, any questions that people might have, we'll try to address those things. And um, I may I may use you as an example, but I think uh, we're going to do a little program uh, probably related to what I call tactical imaging. And tactical is not necessarily, it just means something quick, something we can get in, get out, and, and get some experience. But it gives you an opportunity to go within yourself and let you actually self-diagnose. All I kind of do is help guide you to that point because your inner self already knows the issues that you're having. And so we can actually do that. And there's a version of it that we talk about with for maybe emotional problems and so forth. But there's also a version we do, uh, like people want to do a career path. And so uh, we can actually help them. They want to change, they want to do something different, but they don't know what. Well, actually, yes, you do know what. All I have to do is ask you the right questions and you will actually answer those yourself. Uh, so yeah, th it'll be kind of fun. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, so am I. Yeah. And I, I've had one of these things, so I can tell you it's, it's um, quite delightful. It's quite interesting and quite entertaining. Fun stuff. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, I hope you show up, listener. Um, it's going to be great. Um, and you get the, two, the, true, the Terry Trueblood experience <laughs> on July 16th, 2022. Fantastic. Yeah, it'll be the real deal. I, I don't blow smoke up anybody's skirt if, if you want the real <laughs> stuff. I'm the guy. Uh, I'll tell it like it is, whether you like it or you don't. And uh, at least you'll know uh, from a legitimate source that, you know, I should do this or I should probably go this way. But always your inner guidance is going to be your best. Fantastic. So we'll look forward to seeing you then. Sounds super.